I think we are ready to start now. Something like that. We have our cup of fish ready that, to that's go. That's not a cup of fish. That's a teapot of fish. It is a teapot of fish. No cup. I do want to warn you before we get started here, Martin. This is pro level tea, as my friend Chase has told me before. So I've already had. I don't it. know if you're ready for it. I've already had it because it's not even like an American name. I took Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> I actually don't know how long it's been steeping. So uh, it's going to be a real strong fish. It might be strong fish. No, I'll probably just pour it real soon. Um, but why don't we just jump right into the episode today? Yeah. We got five questions. Five. Five indeed, not six, not four, five questions. So guys, welcome once again to the College Info Geek podcast. Um, we haven't done a five questions episode in a while. Yep. So just a bit of forward, a uh, bit of explanation. Every so often, we will take five questions from our comments section on YouTube, from the subreddit over at uh, collegeinfogeek.com slash community, or from Twitter, or from Smoke Signals, or sometimes we'll just go out in the backyard and dig until we find some, like, scraps of paper that people have left for us. Yeah. You know, definitely. that's where most of the questions come from, but sometimes Twitter and uh, email and things like that as well, and we answer them. So these are fun, these are fun shows. They're a little bit more off the cuff. Uh, and I just, I like going through some questions in a rapid fire style. So if you guys want to do more five questions episodes in the future, leave your questions in the comments or tweet them to us. We yeah. have, I, I've put both of our Twitters in the description on YouTube and they're both in the show notes as well. Cool. Yeah. It's a little default thing. I learned that you can do upload defaults to YouTube. I didn't know this. And then promptly forgot about that for about a year and ever since we moved, I have been like manually going in and setting the uh, the the location of our videos from Iowa to Denver. And like this morning, I was like, you know you didn't what? Just change like I should just change the upload default. Why am I moving it to Denver every time? I don't know. I think it's like what happens when you when you get so busy that you never have time to sit down and like fix your processes. Yeah. You're just constantly putting out fires all the time. So. Yes, I am going to pour this because cup of fish, in addition to being an advanced tea, as my friend Chase would say, is also a black tea that will get very, very bitter if we leave it for too long. So why don't you read off the first question and get us started? All right. So the first question we got is, is it okay to read more than one book at once? No. And probably not, not, probably not at once in the sense that they're literally holding two books and trying to read them at the same time, because I would suggest that that is... That's not a good idea. But at the same time. I'm pretty sure if you do that, LeVar Burton is going to come arrest you. Yeah, maybe. He's the chief of the reading Well, that's actually cool, so do it. <laughs> that would be pretty cool to be arrested yeah. by LeVar Burton. But just two, <laughs> more than one at the same time. You go to your Goodreads, currently reading is more than one. That's, that's the question. Is that okay? My Goodreads currently reading is more than one and also contains, oops, books that I am not currently reading. So oh, yeah, I thought you weren't updating the currently reading thing. I'm not, and that has included so far um, not updating books that I have stopped reading and haven't finished. So I see. I had a little bit of surface tension trouble with that tea spout, but it looks like I'm not as pro level as you are today. But yeah, um, my thought on this is yes, with some caveats. I like caveats. Because I do read more than one book at a time. But there's always like some separating context between each book. So it could be that I'm going through an audiobook at the same time as I'm reading a book during my reading sessions yeah. that I would like to have every day. Um, or it could be like it's a nonfiction book versus a fiction book. But I'm not going to read two fiction books at the same time. And usually I'm not going to read two nonfiction books at the same time unless, like, there's a very specific purpose for reading one of them. Yeah. Like, say, you know, we're going to discuss a book on a podcast episode coming up and I'm already in the middle of another book. I might split time. But I find that the more books you have going, the less you're able to get into, like, deep reading. Yeah. Especially with fiction. Yeah, I would say that's definitely true. So. Yeah. Yeah, there are a few negatives, and that is definitely one of them, because it's more or less what we were talking about in the Essentialism episode, exactly what you don't want to do if you value making progress, because yes. you're putting a little amount of effort into several books rather than a lot into few. And at least when I've done this in the past, one of the big things that happens to me, and this happens with the video games as well, is if I go too long in between getting into one story, 
I will forget the whole context of what was going on. I'll need to reread the whole chapter or even more than that. Sometimes mm-hmm. I have to start the book over. I've replayed 40-hour games because I put too much time in between it and forgot the whole game. And I was like, well, this is dumb. Yeah, I, I don't enjoy say, it anymore. I do that with video games where I pick it up. Like, I started playing Horizon Zero Dawn maybe two months ago. And when I pick it up again, whenever that happens, I may have to restart. Yeah, like, like I you don't put too remember. Much space it's like very quickly it. you don't fading know anymore. where I was. Yeah. So if you were going to read more than one at once, you would it probably like maybe it'd be okay if you had one you're reading on your lunch break, one you read before bed. I I know people who have read more than one book at once. It, it can be fine if that's what makes you happy and you're getting a level of progress that you are comfortable with. Yeah. If that's what you want, but if you're like, I personally want to make progress in books. My to read list is huge. And I get more joy out of a book if I'm focusing on one of a kind at a time. So like you, I'll tend to, at max, have one fiction, one nonfiction, and maybe one in Spanish or another language. Oh, so does a different language actually create enough of a separate context for you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I prefer one when I can have it. So usually it will be one unless I have, like right now I'm trying to read Spanish every day this month specifically. Yeah. So I'm reading two because I'm reading, I'm rereading all the Harry Potter books and I'm reading a book in Spanish all month long. But if it wasn't for that, I'd probably want to read one at a time just because I like that. But I mean, how far are you into Harry Potter right now? Not very far. Okay. Like still first book. Yeah. Isn't there some thing that's going on with like is like everyone rereading There's right like now or something? There's like some sort of big thing where a lot of people are rereading it. I'm not caught up to them yet, but that won't take very long if I try. I just haven't tried. Well, yet. you read the whole seventh book in one day, right? Yeah, like eight hours. Yeah. <laughs> Stayed up all night. It was pretty cool. I can't. I mean, I read fast sometimes. I think the fastest I've ever read is when I was reading the first Mistborn, but I can't imagine reading the whole book in eight hours. Yeah. Like I spent eight hours reading Mistborn and maybe got through 300 pages. I, I wouldn't. Mean, the final Harry Potter books, what, 600, 700? I used to read like 100 pages an hour. I don't I don't think I can now. I'm a little out of practice, mm. a little rusty. But it just seems weird to me because you're you're so adamant about like intaking the universe so deliberately. Like 100 pages an hour, that's really quick. I was super deeply focused. I guess so, yeah. I wonder what that would uh I wonder what that would end up being like per minute. Cuz we did know. all those videos about speed reading and everything. Yeah, I don't know. But I always use the data that about the it. scientific studies have have come up with, which seems pretty reliable. But I don't know. We would have to figure out how many words are in a Harry Potter book, how many pages that splits up into, and then figure out like how many words on average were you reading. Yeah, and like did I, you I've never done enough? actual calculations, yeah. so I'm not sure. Yeah, it's tough. I wonder if it's different for fiction too, because a lot of the studies they will take a passage and then they'll quiz the person on some of the details to test for comprehension. You know, and maybe when you're reading a fiction book and you're super deep into it, maybe you don't remember all the details, like if you were to be quizzed, but you're steeped in it in the moment and can enjoy it. Maybe. You know, I feel like you probably weren't pushing yourself to try to read fast. You were just like, no, I I wasn't trying to read it fast. I was just reading it at the speed that I had to. Yeah. Because I couldn't stop. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've been I've been there before. I don't think I'm doing 100 pages in an hour, but I definitely have zoomed through like Mistborn through, um. King Killer Chronicle is another one. Like both those books, I just sat in the coffee shop and just tore through them as fast as I could. Yeah. Because I had to know what was coming up next. Yeah. But all all this to say, I would I would basically say that it's not good for making progress, but you don't if if that's not what you want to read for, there's no reason to become productive and take away if if it's making you happy. Yeah. To read multiple books and you're reading them as fast as you want. My girlfriend reads more than one book. She has maybe one she reads before bed and one that's on a Kindle and one that she reads that's paper because at night it's easy to read the lit up Kindle screen. So, so like she's reading two and she usually reads fiction, right? Yeah. And she's reading two fiction at once. Yeah. And that clearly works for her. Yeah. So, I mean, plenty okay. of people read plenty more than that. It's just as long as you're making the progress you want, it's fine. I, if you particularly want to read books super fast, maybe it's better to read fewer at a time. But I mean, I don't know. Everybody's I don't even know if everybody's priorities for reading are going to be different. Why? Yeah, it it's not a race. It's not a checklist. Exactly. I know with fiction, um, I'm the kind of person who will like go into Goodreads and I'll look at here's the top hundred fantasy novels of all time or top hundred science fiction that's been published since 2000, and I get this thing in my head where it's like I really want to read all that. Oh, Perdido Street Station. I got to go through all China Melville's catalog and all these like it gets it gets to the point where you build this backlog in your head 
And I feel like that can make me subconsciously try to push too far when I'm reading fiction or to like take on too many at once. But when I think about it, it's like, it's not the, it's not having, like having read, it is reading that's enjoyable. Yeah. Like it's not being able to say, oh, I read this book. I read Neuromancer. I read Harry Potter, whatever it is. It's the experience of sitting there and reading it. So for me, at least, if I have two fiction books, I don't get into that experience. Like I don't get that. Yeah. I'm sitting there being like, man, I got to get through this so I can get to the next book. Yeah, and that's I'll, no fun. I'll find myself feeling guilty like I haven't read this book in several days. Oh, no. Yeah. And then that's why I try not to. But mm-hmm. I'm a very monofocused kind of person. Yeah. And maybe people have more of a struggle with multiple books when it comes to nonfiction because it's like an ambition thing. Like I really want to learn programming and photography and all these things. And uh, I think this really comes back to the question of how many priorities can you have at once? I know back in college, we each did the pick four method, which for yeah. people who don't know, pick four was like this, uh, it was like this goal tracking notebook that was based on some pep talks by Zig Ziglar back in the day. But essentially you would track your goals every day for, what was it, three months? So you, you committed to Maybe. four goals, pick four goals. Yeah, I think it was And three then months. there was a journal page every day for three months where you would write down what you did for each of those goals. And for a while, that was a really good tool for encouraging daily practice. But I think what you and I both ran into was we were already students, so we've got a full class schedule and a part-time job yeah. and whatever clubs we're in. And then we're trying to do daily Japanese practice, daily iOS development, whatever it may be. So I know you said at one point you just like had to pick four that said play video games once a day. Oh, yeah. I, like, I made it so that one was productive and then there was another one that was like – like play video games or have fun with friends or do do something for your happiness because yeah. at at a point I became so overwhelmed I knew that if if I thought all these goals were important enough to write down and make sure I do then I should probably do that about my happiness yeah. or or else none of the goals mean anything you know well for me it was getting to the point where I would uh I would kind of know what I could do to make what I wrote down seem impressive so maybe I'd go through my Wani Kani reviews, like Kanji You're reviews. Just lying to future Tom. It may it kind of was. I, I feel like it was lying in spirit and not in letter. Like, oh, yeah. I really did review a hundred kanji today. But it's like, yeah, but what are your real Japanese goals? Because you haven't had a conversation with somebody since, you know, three months ago and you yeah. haven't studied grammar at all. You're just sitting here in the kiddie pool of kanji review, not knowing what to do with it, but it's something you can write down on your goal sheet. So I don't know. It's all balanced, but I found at least for, with me and I think with you as well, pick four got to the point where it's like four goals became too much. So it was all shallow work on each four goals. Yeah. Or all yeah. four goals every single day. So yeah, I think it all just comes down to like, what's your goal with reading? What type of stuff are you reading? And are you able to get into what you're doing? You know, if yeah, you've got time, if, you feel good about if you're it. Warren Buffett or Charlie Munger, I mean, they're famous for just sitting around reading all day. I bet you that they sit down and they read multiple books a day. But Warren Buffett has the luxury and the lifestyle set up to where he can read all day and apply that to his investments. But yeah. when you're a student, you've got a bunch of things already going on. You maybe have half an hour a day to read, an hour a day to read for pleasure. I really don't think that's you know, well, you're going to use see, your time I, well I didn't splitting read very that much up in college at all because of yeah. that reason. And I don't have time to read that much. Like, I mean, I could I could make time to read, but it would be at the expense of something else that I also prioritize, like playing guitar or all the work I do for this site. I would need to scale back on work or scale back on daily exercise, and I'm not willing to do that. So for me, reading has to be one book, and it often has to be an audiobook. Yeah. Like, I think that may be one of the reasons that I love audiobooks so much is because I just don't have as much time to read. You can actually fit those into your schedule. Yes. Because okay. I know I can, oh, I can go put in 20 or 30 miles on the bike. I love doing that. And while I do that, I can listen to a book. So I'm killing two birds with one stone. That works well for me. For you, I know you don't care about putting in 20 miles on the bike. No, so but if I did, I would want it separately. Read. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I want to sit there and I, I want like, to play guitar every night. I like to think night. a lot on, on bike rides. So. Mm-hmm. You know, and even like you're not watching Game of Thrones. So that's no. an hour a week that you no, have that I don't. And I'm not willing to give that up. No, I'm going to watch DuckTales, you know. <laughs> you watch DuckTales. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> New DuckTales is great. Yeah. Well, the next several episodes aren't out yet, but still. 
That's probably so. That's probably good on this question. I think. Yeah. Um, I did notice in the comments for the last episode, somebody said that your case for your Kindle Fire was like unfathomably cool or something like that. I do think it's pretty cool. It is really cool. I was pretty excited when I saw that it was an option. It's got like that cool like foldy. I know, right? Up thing. Like this is pretty cool, but it's it's pretty also you know normal. Yeah, this is like a really cleverly engineered way to make it stand with minimal material. Yeah, yeah, I I really like that. It's pretty dope. Um, And because I remembered about it, we can actually link the case in the show notes. Oh yeah, people happen to have a Kindle Fire tablet, which I mean, if you got that for thirty five dollars, like that's probably the the tablet most people can have these days. Well, I got it on Prime Day, so it was a little extra off. What? Okay, so this isn't one of the questions we have, but what are the drawbacks that tablet? The Amazon App Store is not that great. Okay. That's so the like biggest you, drawback. You really don't have access to a lot of the Android apps? I could do other things to install a lot of them, but like I'm not going to be able to just go into the App Store and, and search for most. I have Evernote on here. So you do have Evernote? But like okay. th- there, I couldn't get like a Google a Google Docs app or anything like that. The App, app Store is just not nearly as good. That's the drawback. Other than that, okay. it's just a tablet. I'm trying to think because I've got an iPad mini here and this can do almost anything any iPad can do. And I'm not a student anymore. What I do on this is typically I will read books on iBooks, um, take notes in the notes app or an Evernote. And I pull up Google Docs for when we film. Yeah. Like I have the outline there. Um, I guess I'd be curious to know like what what is a typical student wanting to do with a tablet because that could probably fit the yeah, bill. See, these I days. literally only wanted this to write. So I don't yeah. care what's in the app store. Evernote's in there. Then I have an offline notebook that's dedicated to this Kindle and Evernote. Okay. And yeah. that's literally the only thing I do on this is that. And it was cheap oh, enough that it felt justifiable. I don't, I don't like reading on the digital screens. I like reading on the little electronic ink, Kindle yeah. paper white kind of thing. I'm thinking about going back to that. Yeah. Anywho, yes. um, before we move on to the second question, I, I realized I never said the name of the tea, and we're going to get questions about that. So oh. I think, what was it, last it's week's tea fish. was was Cloud Chaser. Yeah. Which, I mean, I feel like these names, this is not an arbitrary name. This is no, um, this is a classic kind this of This is tea. Lopsong Souchong, which is very, very classic tea. It's very smoky. So you're going to, if you go to a tea shop, if they have Lopsong Souchong, it will be called Lopsong Souchong. Yeah, it's, but it's not like a custom blend. Yeah, I don't think the Cloud Chaser is going to be called Cloud Chaser at a different tea shop. It's just that no. tea shop decided to call it that. It was some floral blend of green tea and yeah. I don't know, rose petals or something. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't bad. But yeah, I figured I would just say the name of the tea in case people are curious. And I do really like it. It's actually really good with um with cream in it. Hmm. At least for me. Interesting. Maybe not for you. Never put cream on smoked fish before. Well maybe you should try. All right. So question number two. How can I start networking if I haven't gone past my gen eds yet or I don't feel qualified? So we have our classic imposter syndrome question here. Yes. I am not worthy of even talking to these professional people at this network event or at this career fair. That, that's not going to help. What do you do? It's not going to help. Yeah. Uh, I want to challenge the whole like, I'm not qualified because I haven't gone past gen eds thing first because you don't have to wait for your curriculum to hand you opportunities to get qualified. Yeah. And like the people who do that are going to be always behind. When I was a freshman, clearly I wasn't in my business classes yet, but I got into business council and I got a job at the campus IT center. And I spent a bunch of time like building computers or building my own websites, like doing all these cool things, applying for the freshman honors program. When I was in high school, I was in a business club where I literally built a website from scratch for a competition. I did an HTML coding competition. I did a business plan competition. These are all opportunities that were available to basically anyone of any age in the high school or in the college. You just had to go reach out and take them. Yeah, like you don't need permission from any sort of courses or school or even your degree to be good at something or yeah. to or to learn about it mm-hmm. yeah so i guess that's the first thing like go get the qualifications and by qualifications i don't mean like go get a degree early but go get something that you can talk about yeah like if you have my my favorite saying and this isn't a quote because it's something i made up but it's like my favorite thing that i've ever made up is like show up and have something to show 
So be the kind of person who does show up to events and networking things and career fairs, but have something to show, even if it's small, even if it's a little side project you did. You can say, oh, I completed the JavaScript course on Codecademy. You could do that in two days probably. Yeah, or even something as small as just keeping up on the news in that area yeah. would give you something to talk about with these people. Yes. Just like I've been keeping up with technology or I've been keeping up with politics or I've been keeping up with uh, what's going on in agriculture. You know, that that makes you knowledgeable and it's just news. Anybody could read that. We did get a request from a viewer last week for us to do an, uh, an episode on like jobs or internships we got in a non-traditional way. Yeah. Like just like not through an interview or application process. And I will talk about this in that episode in more detail. But when I worked at the campus IT center, we spent like we had some downtime because it was just you wait for calls pretty much. Yeah. And when you finish a call, like you go to the back of the queue. So if it's a slow day and we've got five people there, I've got five calls that can come in before I have to take another one. So we spent some times playing like O game and dumb like browser games. But I also spent a lot of time on sites like Tech Republic. And like uh, overclock.net, just reading about technology. So when I went to this freshman leadership conference put on by this big financial company and they put me with a mentor, I was kind of able to talk about enterprise level IT to like a small degree. Yeah. Like I knew what a, what a backbone is in a network. You at least knew the terms and you yeah. knew, knew kind, of, kind of what was going on. I know the difference between like a router and a switch and all these things. And I, I knew like, you know, just like how corporations set up IT. I knew a little bit about security. So obviously not enough to be hired on the spot for a job, but to this guy who was like the vice president of IT infrastructure who dealt with like all the networking and security and all that kind of stuff, he can see, wow, this kid is 18 years old, freshman in college, clearly not even into the business or MIS classes yet, but he already knows about a backbone. He already knows about like, you know, um, SharePoint servers or whatever else I'd been reading about. Like that shows potential. Yeah. And that's really the thing you're aiming for, is to show potential to the people who are more experienced than you. Even if you're not qualified right now for what they'd want, like they're gonna be able to see that spark of something that could grow to something really, really useful later on. Yeah, if you're just two steps ahead of your peers, then they know that continuing forward, you're still gonna be two steps ahead of them, and yeah. that's gonna make you really useful later. Mm -hmm. And this is why I say like have business cards, because number one, it looks better than just like, saying your name and hoping they remember it. And it feels cool. It feels cool. Um, I always get like the double thickness ones from Moo because differentiation counts or the round of corner ones. Just yeah. something better than like your your crappy ones from Vistaprint or something like that, like the free ones. Yeah, I'm actually just cutting out printer paper. <laughs> or printer paper. <laughs> it's all floppy. It looks, it looks wonderful. Yeah, I've seen people do like uh, their own like magic cards. I oh, like yeah. those or their own Pokemon yeah, cool. cards. Those are pretty fun. Or like the metal cutout business cards. I've always been thinking about like, how do I differentiate myself? How do I make them remember me amongst the stack of cards they get or amongst the, you know, tons of people who come up and introduce themselves? Yeah. But even if you don't have an immediate purpose for going to a networking event, um, or actually let's use the career fair as an example here. When I was a freshman, I went to both career fairs, the fall semester one and the spring semester one. And you weren't at Iowa State at this time. Nope. But I remember every other person in the dorm, in our learning community, they didn't want to go. Like, they were like, why would I go to the career fair this year? I'm not planning on looking for an internship until after sophomore year. And I'm like, you guys should go because the same recruiters who are going to be here this year are probably going to be back next year. And when they see that kid who came up last year, they're going to be like, oh, it's you again. I remember you. So you already have a bit of rapport. And you've already impressed them being the freshman who's just there interested, wanting to get to know the recruiters, get to know a little bit about the internship programs of certain uh, certain companies, even though they're not planning on applying that year. You come back and they're like, yeah, I remember you. I remember you were ambitious and curious. You're at the top of my list already. Yeah, not to mention that just going into that area means that next year, that same area, they'll probably do it in the same place, will be less new to you. So you'll maybe have a little yes. less anxiety going there because you're like, I know what's in there. I know what to expect. Oh, yeah. I mean, how many times do you ever go to the career fair? I don't even remember, but I think I did have to go really early on, maybe freshman year. Okay. I stopped going after, probably after junior year, because by senior year, I was like, I want to take CIG full time. There's no longer a compelling reason for me to go. But I went to every career fair 
all three years before that. Oh yeah. And I remember like, because I've written so many blog posts about this and also kept a journal for certain points in, the, in my college career, I remember being very nervous my first career fair. Like I was walking around, I'm the freshman, nobody from the dorm came with me, so I'm not with anybody. And I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> so I remember my career counselor had told me, if you're scared, go talk to companies that you don't necessarily have on the top of your list first, just to get some practice. And who knows, like maybe they would end up being really cool. You never know if they happen to have some internship program that would be perfect for you. But yeah. at the very least, you can fumble and make some mistakes while talking with somebody who you didn't intend to apply to or apply with yeah. later on. And then once you've done that, you can take the skills that you've learned and the calmer nerves and take that to the next recruiter who you do care about. So that's what we always said. Like if you've got Union Pacific and principal at the top of your list, go talk to five other companies first, just so like you can get the nerves off. But I mean, the same thing applies on a longer time scale. You go fall, you're gonna feel better in spring. You go spring, you're gonna feel better next year. Yeah, and it, and it, it just makes sense. You don't have to wait for school to tell you what to do. Yeah. And networking doesn't, if people are going to just completely cast you out of their memory because they didn't think you were good enough yet, mm -hmm. then they suck anyway. So yeah. <laughs> that's like, I would just talk to somebody else. But yeah. Not to mention that half the stuff that we do, our courses did not tell us to do. So clearly, yes. I, I mean, I talk about language all the time. I, di I didn't major in that. No paperwork anywhere says mm -hmm. that I'm qualified to do that. And yet you've taught English. Yes. And mm -hmm. I've never done anything that told me I was qualified to do that. If you go out and make yourself feel confident, you're probably more qualified than, than a lot of people. Yeah. And I'll actually give you guys like exactly what you can say. So if you go to the career fair, you're a freshman, you go up to a recruiter for a company you're interested in, you can just say, hi, my name's Thomas, I'm a freshman majoring in MIS, or I'm gonna major in MIS, and because I'm a freshman, I'm not planning on applying to any internship programs this year, but I just wanted to get some information and get my name out there, go introduce myself, and you know, talk to some people. It's all you gotta say. And then, you listen. Yeah. You just listen, listen to them talk about what they usually hire interns for, or what, you know, a lot of recruiters are, they, they're they not recruiters full-time. They're a full-time employee in some department, and then they've been just like kind of handpicked from the department to go to the career fair yeah. and recruit. In fact, our friend Nick, he has been to the career fair as a recruiter. Oh. But he's not a recruiter. Like, he's, he's an IT guy. He works in, uh, I don't remember which company he works in. I think it's like Boston Scientific. I think so. So he works in IT there, but he's come down to be at the career fair. He was in the opposite shoes of, you know, a few years prior. So you can ask them, like, are you a full-time recruiter or do you have a job somewhere else in the company? And, like, ask them about that. <laughs> what do they do for, on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, that's pretty funny, actually, because in that case, I mean, that person's not really qualified to be a recruiter. That's not their job. <laughs> that's true. It isn't but their job. Have, you got to go out and wing it anyway. <laughs> They're just as unqualified as you are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and before I forget, in addition to things like news, nonfiction books are good. Just, just for delving into a into a topic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Get into it. All right. Question number three: Is it safe to have an online presence? I hope we, so. We got this question via email. Yeah, I hope so too. Because, because my face is now on the internet. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good question, though. I remember it when is. I was it has a kid, value. parents were like never use your real name online, never post a picture of yourself online. Yeah. You know, if you're not like, I don't know, Burrito Blaster 589, like people are going to find you and they're going to steal your credit card information. So never use your name. Like, but today it's it's kind of like flipped. It's like share everything about yeah, you. Put as much kind of personal information as you can online. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's all process of like mitigation and just figuring out what your risk tolerance level is, but also weighing that against the potential benefits or what you potentially give up by not, oh, yeah. you know? And this is something like, I'm not going to be the person who goes out here and says, you have to have literally every social profile ever, or you have to be literally I everywhere. Don't. You don't, you know, and you've done pretty well for yourself. So it all depends on what your goals are, what point you're at in your development, what kind of career you want to have. If you want to be a social media manager, then maybe you need to have a little bit more of a social presence than if you want to be a doctor. You yeah. Know? It's hard to say. Um, I just think like you do need to have some sort of online presence because when you don't have a job already, you don't know where you're going to end up. 
So at least in my mind, it's like, I want to make myself easily findable within the circles of people that I'm going to want to make connections with. Yeah. You know? So for me, that was like having a website, having a professional Twitter, having a LinkedIn profile. And uh, like when I did web design and graphic design, it was having a Behance portfolio. uh, portfolio. Yeah. And it kind of depends on which industry you're in and, and stuff like that. Because through LinkedIn, I've gotten tons of people that at least messaged me at least reached out with some form of interest Mm -hmm. and if i just didn't have an online thing maybe i wouldn't even realize that people wanted the skills that i had or or maybe i wouldn't know to talk to those people Mm -hmm. but um along with the question of like should i have an online presence there comes the question of like how do i properly share things about myself and mitigate the potential for anything bad happening yeah so one really good example, um, I use an app called Strava to track how many miles I bike and to track my my times and things like that. Well, they have a feature where you can go in and you can hide where you live. So like if your route starts anywhere within like half of a mile radius from where you live, it'll just kind of like hide that part of the route. So for me, like Strava is very personal. The only person, I, I only share my route details with like Anna's uncle because he's a cyclist as well. Mm-hmm. And like one other good friend of mine. So, but I can imagine like if I was just like making my profile super public, I wouldn't want my initial start point to be showing all the time. Yeah. It's just like, here's where yeah, you live. Yeah, I, I wouldn't want to like, I, I don't tweet pictures from my windows. I don't, I don't even yeah. think about doing anything about where I'm at currently. Sometimes it'll be like, I was at the Denver Botanic Gardens, but that's like, that's just a public place. Yeah. Well, I mean, I feel like you and I think about this harder than we used to. I certainly do. Well, yeah, I do. Like, I'm very aware of the fact that the YouTube channel has become a big thing. So, w- earlier on, I did not care. In fact, I didn't make this public, but when I was in RA, I built a website. And I used, like, this this online open source kit to make it look like an iPhone app. It was called Stock Your RA. And it basically showed where I checked in last on Foursquare... It showed my calendar and it had like my Twitter and then it had like links to call me, text me, call me, beat me if you want to reach me. And I gave the URL to my students. So anyone who walked by my door in my dorm hall would have seen the URL and they could have seen oh, exactly so where I was. It was just like last. on the wall somewhere? It was just on my door. Yeah, yeah. See, and like if you had a stalker or something, you probably would have thought, I shouldn't do this. It's yes. a horrible idea. So especially depending on what 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 well, is yeah. your risk tolerance? On the flip side, I know somebody who um, had a stalker. Yeah, and, and you wouldn't want to put your address up like that. She had to have her information removed from the student directory, like all these things. So obviously, like me being a guy, there is kind of like an inherent perspective that I have that is different than what maybe a girl would have. Yeah. So I've always been comfortable making myself a little bit more findable and available on the internet possibly because of that yeah but if you're not comfortable with stuff like that i don't i don't see a lot of problem at least with just sharing like you know if you're just sharing an article or you're sharing your thoughts on something that it's not your location that's not your personal data yeah then i don't see i mean obviously people can harass you online that that can happen if you still Mm -hmm. just do that but it's less of a problem, I think, than sharing your location with people if you're concerned yeah. about that sort of thing. So, I mean, when I use Instagram or when I use Twitter, um, I don't tweet with locations. I don't Instagram with locations unless I'm traveling. You know, if I, and e- you know, even then, like if I owned a house, I may not, I might even, uh, not even put locations on my tweets because somebody would be like, "Oh, he's not home," you know. And I, I've never cared about that because huh. I had roommates all the time. But like, if I didn't live in the the sort of place I live in now where there's, you know, better security than just a house. I might not be like, Hey guys, I'm totally away from home right now. Yeah. You know, here's a screenshot like, of my most valuable stuff. Exactly. It's all about mitigation. It's all about being smart. I think, or when I'm out tweeting, um, you know, or my, my daily CIG 30 day fitness picture, I'm like, I try to make sure my the place I live is not in the background of that picture. Yeah. Just like, so I'm not just giving away where I live. All those kind of things I think about. Um, But it's not just about stuff like that. Like, I think you also want to practice good online security. And this applies to more than just your online presence. This applies to literally everything. So I'm talking about... Passwords and stuff. Yeah. Have a strong, unique password for each online account you use. Um, I use LastPass, which is an online um, password manager 
to manage all that. So I literally don't know what most of my passwords are. But but also two-factor authentication is important for things like yes. that because if your password to LastPass is easily guessable, yeah. then obviously it didn't help you much. Yeah, and I've had to think real hard about this because I've seen some YouTubers who like they even had two-factor auth on stuff and still gotten hacked. So like, yeah. There's, I don't know. I always think about like, what's the weakest link in the chain, all that kind of stuff like that. But at the very least, have two-factor auth on your your uh, your important accounts. Have good, strong passwords. I would say if you're going to do unique, like crazy passwords that are super long, know the password to your email. Yes. Because that's where password resets will go. So if something messes up and you like get locked out of LastPass or you just don't have access to it someday and you really need to sign into your Xbox account or something like that, like... You'll have the act. You'll always know what your email password is, so you can do a password reset to your email. Yeah, yeah. So know how to do that kind of stuff. Uh, let's see here. Keep your computer software up to date. Like if you use Windows, make sure you have Windows Defender on. Um, I also recommend having Malwarebytes as well, because apparently Windows Defender is like an antivirus, but not an anti-malware. And hmm. I don't really know like the explicit difference between those two things, but apparently malware is more like about browser exploits and things like that. Maybe maybe viruses are only things that infect your file system. I'm not sure these days. It's been too long. I thought since it was I've been that they, IT game. they like spread or self-replicate easier or something like that. Oh, it could be that. But eh. yeah, I, sure. I don't mess with that stuff anymore either. All I know so. is I got malware bytes that's like anti-malware and anti-virus and there's like it kind of yeah, they get like two things. But Windows Defender takes care of the virus side of that. Uh and we do have a really old episode on online security. It's episode three of the podcast. What year did that come out in? 2013. So some of these software recommendations I may or may not have given, I don't even remember what I said in that episode, Yeah, may not be relevant anymore, but I probably did go a little more in depth on two-factor authentication. It's probably like still that. got good concepts, just it's like double-check the resource links or something. I actually used that podcast episode as homework one time. Oh, yeah? I was in a class... Which, ironically, the class was taught by one of the people who was in my hall that I was an RA for. Oh. It was really weird. Hmm. It was really weird, like, being his RA, but then going to class and him being my teacher. That is weird. But I can't remember what class it was. It was, like, some sort of one-credit, really easy class. But for some reason, we had to do some assignment having to do with online security. And I was like, well, I did this podcast. Does that count? And he's like, yes, that counts, actually. That's like 45 minutes of content on online security. That's cool. So good enough. Yeah. Um, if you if you do go listen to that episode, I will say, number one, be ready to cringe. Uh-oh. Because it's one of my first ever podcasts. And I also did a lot of dumb jokes in the intros. Uh, and number two, it's only audio. Because we started the YouTube channel at episode 100. So, yeah. Yeah. You'd have to find it on the website. Um. I'm trying to think of like anything else that might be useful to mention on the online security mitigation front. Um, I'm not well, sure. I mean, if we if we get a bunch of questions or we we think of a bunch of stuff yeah. we're missing, we could always do like a a redo, new That's updated true. 2017. We probably security should episode because 2013 is making me it's feel old. old right now. We we probably just should do like a full. So we could how probably to yourself online. find out how to get more in depth. Yeah. Um, on the flip side of that though, your online presence enables you to be found and it enables you to put forth the things that you want to put forth into the world. So me being a blogger, I was able to put out my thoughts on college success and productivity into the world. If you were a doctor, you know, or like a pre-med student, my friend Ryan did a very good job at building an online presence that branded him as a med student who yeah. was really ambitious and was doing all this volunteer work with uh, Doctors Without Borders and stuff like that. So, And not only that, but with that specific kind of content where like you're both writing articles, it's even about things you're learning, like with the medical stuff, isn't that sort of reminiscent of like the Feynman technique where you're teaching something yeah. and through that you become better at it? So mm-hmm. not only is it benefiting you professionally because of how others see you, but literally because of your own qualifications increasing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's content creation, so I feel like that's a little bit yeah. of a step up, like beyond yeah, Just that's only a specific type of online, online presence. presence. But yeah, but I mean, I, I read a statistic back in 2012 that 25% of recruiting is done on LinkedIn. So I don't know what the percentage is now, but I know it is clear that recruiters use LinkedIn to look people up. Yeah. You know, so I mean, I this is, 
I hesitate to like tell people to use specific networks, but I made sure I had a public and very well tailored Facebook account. Now, not everyone has to do that, but I chose to do that. I made sure that I have had a professional Twitter account. And that doesn't mean I never make jokes. Like people can go on my Twitter and see that I have like a picture of a goat pinned as my pinned tweet. It says yeah. like, this is what I look like no, in real life. It's a professional goat. This is a very professional goat. All goats are professional. We just can't tell that because they're kind of on a higher plane of existence. Fair. But. I can't disprove that. I'm not tweeting pictures of myself like partying hardcore or even though it's legal here, smoking weed or something like that. Like it's professional and funny. Yeah. And I know my audience. I know that I have occupied a certain position. Like people kind of already know that I do professional things so if i am a little goofy it's not gonna hurt me and even when i was a student i realized this i'm not going into law like i don't have lawyers who might be scrutinizing an application to mine going and looking at my twitter and being like well this guy tweets about goats we can't have him in our law firm you know llama llama and llama incorporated has no goats allowed thank you very much that seems reasonable so you have to gauge like what in industry am i am uh, going for am i going for like some very traditional old school industry like finance or law or possibly medicine, then what you put out into the world is going to have to be a little bit more tailored and restrained than if you are going to be, I don't know, a journalist, a DJ or a DJ or a blogger who just, I don't know, writes about college tips. Like it, it really depends. So yeah, and we've talked about that in several podcast episodes, so I won't go on about it for too long. The next question we have um, which I'm interested to hear some of your ideas on because you told me that you've got some ideas. I have some ideas. What's an alternative to the cold shower challenge if I live somewhere warm where a cold shower is already preferred? And this probably also counts if you live somewhere really cold where a cold shower will just yes. kill you. So, so Yeah, <laughs> exactly. In the winter in Iowa, I made sure that if I was doing cold showers, I was not turning it all the way to cold. It's actually a lukewarm shower. <laughs> <laughs> I do want to give people some context here, though. So I made a video a while ago called my number one self-discipline technique. And spoilers, the number one self-discipline technique is to take a cold shower every day. Now, the reason that I think this is a great technique for building self-discipline is because you are faced with this binary choice with only two options. And it's a choice that you are going to be presented with most likely every day, at least every other day, I'm guessing. You know, you should probably shower at least every two days, I'm guessing. Yeah. Unless you're just some person who never smells. Well, I don't know the science about this, but every every few days, I probably, have to shower every probably, day. Probably. Well, yeah. I also work out every Please. day. So that's, that's another thing. Yeah. So anyway, like you shower regularly. So it's a situation you're already going to be presented with and you have this choice. Turn the handle to warm and be comfortable or turn the handle to cold and take an uncomfortable shower. Now, this choice isn't going to harm you. In fact, there's a lot of benefits to cold showers. I find that they make me feel more energetic, more refreshed. Um, there's potential like thermogenic weight loss benefits. I don't want to get too much into like the scientific stuff because it's a little like contentious. But I know from experience, a cold shower just makes me feel fired up. So it's very good once I get out of the shower, but obviously doesn't feel so good when you're in it. At least yeah. that first initial shock. So a lot of people don't want to do that. So if you can if you can turn that handle too cold, you're saying I accept discomfort. I'm willing to deal with discomfort. And if you do that, then you're going to be more able to accept discomfort in other areas of your life. Like I really don't want to deal with this stupid homework assignment when I'd rather be playing Halo or something like that. Yeah. So it's all about building self-discipline. But a lot of people in the comments were like, "Dude, I live in an area where there's literally no cold water. Like it's too it's too hot here. I live in the Caribbean or something." Yeah. Or some other things. So what are some other things you could do to start building self-discipline? Now, I had to rack my brain on this. Obviously, we can come up with things all day long, like wake up every day and never hit the snooze button, get out of bed immediately after hitting snooze, or take the stairs instead of the elevator, which I think that's a very good one. I, I struggle to find another situation quite like cold showers where it's a situation you're presented with every day where you have the option of like very easily choosing the harder one or the more uncomfortable one instead of the comfortable one. Yeah. I think elevator versus stairs is a very good one, a very close one. Um, obviously the stairs takes more time, 
So then you, you can rationalize like, oh, I need to get up to my apartment real quick. So I'm taking the elevator. Like the thing about the cold shower challenge is the only variable is the comfortable or an uncomfortable nature of the shower. Yeah. It so won't it's, take any it's more really time. simplified. Yeah. I won't take any more time. That's really the big thing is like, there's no room for rationalization. So I, I struggled to find another challenge where rationalization couldn't creep in and make an excuse. Well, I mean, you could probably also rationalize not taking a cold shower if you're just like, yeah, I'm not feeling too well today. Maybe I'll get sick. Or so you could you could make up stuff for anything, even if That's it doesn't make true. sense. Human brains are sneaky. We're, they're too <laughs> smart to do things that are smart. That's right. the problem. Okay. But so at, at least a couple of the ideas that I had and... Uh, they're not going to fit the situation exactly. They're not just like flip this switch and then it works suddenly. Yeah. Because I don't know if everything is exactly like a shower, unfortunately. But one thing, and I was actually doing this for a little bit, not for this purpose, but just because, is let's say you don't like to meditate. Meditating in the morning is a form of self-discipline, but especially okay, yeah. if... So I was actually meditating and making a cup of tea before I ate breakfast in the mornings a few times. So even if I was a little oh. hungry, I was still meditating anyway, and I found that that actually made me almost focus better on the meditation because meditation's a very... It feels like it goes with that, you know, the self-discipline of, of extending your fast well, and meditating. Well, I do remember going to yoga, and they'd always be like, yoga is best practiced on an empty stomach yeah, I just an open mind. <laughs> and, like, I know I'm hungry, and I'm like, I could eat, but I was going to meditate first. Yeah. So I will sit here at least for this five minutes and then I can eat. You know how like they have the studies about does this kid reach for the marshmallow immediately yes. or will they wait to get two marshmallows? It's kind of like that. I want my food, but I also said I would meditate. So am I willing to wait for the food? That's thinking outside the box because that isn't necessarily an activity that you're making a choice on. It's ordering of the activities. Yeah. And I, that actually makes sense to me because I'll wake up a lot of times and I'm like, I immediately want breakfast. And I don't want to shower first. I just want breakfast right now. And I could get up and shower first. Yeah. So if you're just like, I'm going to push off breakfast a little bit to prove to myself that I have control over what I'm doing in the morning. Okay. Yeah. So introducing a little bit of conscious delay in something you were already going to do. Yeah. That can build self-discipline. I like that. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Uh, so I had a couple other ideas. One was with your breakfast, add something that's healthy that you don't really like. You know, like you got your toast, your cereal, but you also got like a handful of spinach or a chunk of broccoli. And you're like, I don't want to eat that at all. It's not even cooked well or anything, but I'm going to eat it. It's good for me and it makes breakfast suck a little more. So it's yeah. self-discipline. It's not as simple. Obviously, you can be out of that. Yeah. You can be out. So there are a lot more excuses that creep in when you try to add that. But I mean, the health benefits would be nice too if you made yourself eat some vegetables every day you yeah. didn't want to eat. Um, I had refused to touch your phone. Until you've been up oh, for yeah. 20 to 30 minutes, okay, depending. So you could do this with the Forest app, which yes. I used to use a lot. And I do have on my phone now, but I have found that I don't need it as much now because I will accidentally just not use my phone. I just sit on a thing, and then I'll be like, wait, where's my phone? Oh, it's still in the bedroom. I haven't touched it for the last hour. And I like that feeling, but if you're the kind of person who immediately needs the news, immediately needs to check all your social stuff, just – put it off and you're not allowed to touch it for a little bit. It doesn't have to be that long. Yeah. The point isn't that it's 10 hours, no social media. That's your discipline. The point is that you had control to at least decide when you were going to do it. Yeah. And that kind of goes back to that whole idea of the impulse to inject some novelty into yeah. the moment because you're bored versus the deliberate choice to choose or to check those things after a certain amount of time spent doing something else. Yeah. And that's, that's why I like these because it's, Self-discipline to me is overriding the little animal brain that says, I want to do this now. Yeah. I want to say, I will tell you when you will do this. Right. And we'll do it. But when I said we were going to do it, not because I just got obsessed and I had to break into my friend's closet and steal the snack cakes that he hid in there. <laughs> Clyde. I don't think Clyde's going to watch this. No, he's not. I'll have to send this little tiny snippet to him. Yeah. So we know we'll never <laughs> forget. Yeah. Never. Never. <laughs> I saw a lot of interesting ideas in the comments on that video. Like one person was like, force yourself to brush your teeth with the opposite hand as what you usually use or make yourself right left handed for 30 days or something like that. That actually like, people were really thinking they were trying to find something that fit that criteria of something you were already going to do and it doesn't take any more time. Now, I would argue 
me right and left-handed. It's yeah, going to have it, some consequences. It may take more time. It's going to take more time. But I do want to point out that the cold shower thing is a somewhat unique example of a binary choice where they're only the only difference is your level of comfort, which makes it a very good exercise for building self-discipline. But that doesn't mean you can't use other things that may not have that quality. You just need to find a way to add maybe some external motivators or external controls. So what I've been doing over on Instagram for the past 33 days is uh, after I released that how to break bad habits video, I was like, I should do something to break one of my own bad habits to demonstrate this. So I decided to go on Instagram and for 30 days, I was going to exercise intensely every day and post a video or not a video, post some sort of picture of it on my Instagram. Yeah. And I've got a hashtag. It's CIG 30 day. So for those of you who've been wondering what CIG 30 day is, that's what it is. Um, it's really like break a bad habit in 30 days, not necessarily just exercise. That's just the one I've chosen. But for the past 30 days, and I've decided to extend it indefinitely because I kind of want to like, I want to let people get in on the challenge and be doing it with me. And I don't think that it's that hard to exercise every day. So I don't necessarily see the reason to stop after 30 days. But for 30 days, I knew if I didn't exercise today and if I didn't post that picture, then whoever follows me on Instagram, somebody's going to remember, they're going to notice I didn't post and I'm going to hear about it. Yeah. And I didn't want that. So Throughout this 30 days, I've been building the self-discipline to exercise every single day because there's a consequence kind of looming over my head. And if I were to just stop doing the challenge, I, I truly believe that I would be more likely to exercise on a daily basis because I've just kind of ingrained these habits. Even if it's just choosing a coffee shop that's five miles away so I get a 10-mile bike ride in, um, yeah. you know, instead of like, because our favorite coffee shop is like right over there. So I could easily go through a day going to that coffee shop, coming back, really doing no physical activity at all. But this morning, I'm like, you know what? I'm not doing that. I'm going to ride four miles to this other cafe I like and then four miles back. So I'm at least getting eight miles in. And I might go ride more tonight. I kind of like, I want to, you know? Yeah. Well, you've built a kind of a good habit now, and it would be kind of ridiculous to just say, yeah, well, the only reason I was building it was because of the 30 days. So yes. now I'm going to intentionally kill the good habit. <laughs> I often think the 30-day challenge is there to build the habit. Yeah. And, you know, you take the training wheels off eventually. You want to take the training wheels off the bike, you're still going to ride the bike. Yeah, and, and it's not even as important as that you do it as intensely as you did for the 30 days. But yeah. that you do anything at all for every day is better. That was what it was. And there was one day during the 30 days where you remember this, both of us felt like we were going to throw up. That was not a good day. It was not a good day at all. Um, I mean, we did acquire the wood to build this shelf that day, so that was something. Was, we, we worked hard for this set. We did work hard for this set. <laughs> yeah, Martin wasn't kidding when he said you better appreciate it because he was like almost puking in my car. <laughs> didn't, though. You didn't puke? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. For the good. record, it was because of self-discipline. Self-discipline, yeah. Yep. Something like that. that was I, I was telling myself, like, Tom, you will not puke in this Home Depot. You ain't going to do it. Yep. But I could feel like the tingling going up my jaw. And I was takes. like, this isn't good. Uh, it's probably not true. We got lucky. Well, I went back. I think we got lucky. Yeah. I think we just didn't get enough of the bug that was going around. But I went home and I was like, I'm in the middle of this challenge. Now, when you have a challenge with an external motivator, it is not a license to be stupid. So I'm not going to go do a hardcore workout when I feel like I might be sick. And then yeah. like puke over yeah, somebody that, at the gym. Like, that's not happening. But- I did the seven minute workout on my phone because the it, it was more uh, I need to do something today. I need to have the self-discipline to do some exercise, to get moving, to get out of my comfort zone, even if I feel a little bit sick. Yeah. And you know what? If I, I told myself at the beginning of this challenge, if I somehow break my leg, then somebody's going to wheelchair me down to the gym and I'm going to do some pull-ups. Yeah. Or I'm going to do some shoulder presses or something. Ooh. Like- I was like, I'm, I'm going to that do this. That would have been pretty intense. No excuses, man. would have been pretty intense. So, yeah, I feel like I've I've gone way into the weeds with this, but I think it was good. That's fine. That's, that what, good. that's what we do here on this podcast. <laughs> that is what we do. I mean, that's the point of the podcast a little bit. It's less, it's it's more casual. Yeah. Less, yeah, very I, casual. I couldn't think of an opposite. Formal. Less, less formal. Um, formal, less structured. Yeah. You know, it's a little bit of structure, but that's what the videos are for. Anyway. Uh, question number five, last question here. What should I do if I have to work early and don't have time for a productive morning routine? What should you do indeed? What should you do? Yeah. 
So I think that a, a morning routine is very useful, but one of the main benefits of the morning routine is that you're making progress on a few habits that you want to do every day. And if you work early, then just do them later. Yeah, it doesn't have you to know? be in the morning specifically. It could be a routine that happens during your lunch break. It could be a routine that happens as soon as you get home from class mm-hmm. or work. Or it could be a routine that you do to wind down right before bed. Yeah. But on the opposite hand, if you really want mornings to yourself, then use that as a motivator to be looking for a way to change your work situation. One of our very good friends has been working like 50, 55 hours a week ever since we moved here. She had two jobs. So she had like no time to do anything she wanted to do. And an opportunity arose. Um where there was a job open at, at Anna's work. And she was like, I'm not sure if, if she's qualified for this. And I'm like, you know what? I think that she's close to qualified and you might as well try it. What's the worst that can happen? Yeah. So tried it and she got the job. So now she has gained those mornings. She has gained afternoons, she's gained weekends and all those things. And I think it's all a part of just like being willing to try to change your work situation if you really want to change it. Now, hey, if you love waking up early and working early, like I've been there before, that's fine. Just make time in the afternoon to do your productive habits. Yeah. I had to wake up at uh, 4 a.m. back in the summers when I was in high school to go to Tassel Corn. No time for morning routine then. I'd pack my lunch cooler the night before, had all my granola bars and sandwiches and gummy bears ready to go, my giant tub of Gatorade, basically wake up, throw the clothes on, I'm out the door. Yeah, that's oh, and, all there is. And for the record, I would probably, if if not the morning, I would probably lean towards a separation between class slash work and home stuff just because it's a nice mental transition into not being at work or class. A separation between... Like if you had to move your routine, I would probably lean toward making it. I just got home from work or school. I'm going to do my oh, routine yeah, because yeah. I like having a mental separation that says, forget about work right now. It's gone. It's gone. It's home time now. So you would use the routine as that separator? Yeah. As opposed to as what? Like a, as, as opposed like to like doing it at night after you've relaxed or something like that? Well, I just sometimes if you, – you know how it is we, because I, we have work email on our phones. We have things like that. And it's hard to disconnect from things sometimes now. Okay. So yeah, yeah. when I was getting home from my old job, I would still be thinking about it. You know, it's, it's servers. It's web stuff. It's stuff that I do need to think about. It's important. Yeah. And I'm trying to solve tomorrow's problem. I don't want to be solving tomorrow's problem. Sometimes I want to check out and it's hard to disconnect. So if I had a routine to disconnect and do some other stuff and remind me of my personal life, I think that would give me an added benefit. Something that helps you deliberately wind down basically. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Yeah, well, I think that covers it pretty well. Um, Interested to hear what people think in the comments for all five of these questions, but especially that last one. And yeah, if you have additional questions, we'll do more of these episodes in the future from time to time. I think we used to do them once a month. I'm not sure if we'll do them I think that we used frequently. To. I don't know. Yeah. Well, because I'm OCD, I don't want to see that five questions template once every four videos on the YouTube channel. <laughs> like that's my main reason in my head for not wanting to do it that often. <laughs> that is a, that's a very Which solid reason. I clearly, I like, I know I could just make two templates or something. Yeah. <laughs> or we could just start doing a thumbnail that focuses on one of the questions instead of it being a hand. Yeah. I don't Actually, know. that's probably a better idea than what we're doing now. Like that would probably be a better thumbnail. So maybe, maybe if we do it that way, I don't know. Um, don't know. if you that's... guys really like the five questions episodes, we can do more. Let us know. I mean, they are fun to do. Well, a lot I know of these people questions like them. won't take an hour to talk about by themselves, so it's nice to that's be able true. to at least still answer them. Yeah, we get way. the little questions that just can't be their own episode, so that's good. Anywho, if you're on YouTube, there are going to be um, links to show notes in the description down below, and if you want to help support this show, you can give it a rating and review on iTunes. It's really easy to do. If you have iTunes installed, you just look for College Info Geek on the podcast store write a quick review that helps us both bump up the rankings in iTunes, but also just tells us how we can do better, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, how we can keep improving this show. So thank you so much if you do that. If you're listening to the audio feed of this episode, then cigpodcast.com slash 173 is where you can go to get those show notes. We'll have everything linked up. 
And uh, we are also doing timestamps now on the YouTube channel. So we had a lot of feedback about that in the last episode. Yeah, which working on it. I totally get it. You know, some people, I, I think a lot of people kind of get the podcast is supposed to be a casual like conversation. It's going to have tangents and side conversations. Yeah, but if you don't have a whole hour to search for what you wanted. Yeah, you know, that's the way I listen to podcasts. I throw it on, I go for a bike ride. It's great. I, I love when the hosts go off into a tangent, but because we have a podcast where we're like, how to get prepared for a new semester or how to prepare for an interview or something like that, I totally understand why we should have timestamps. So um, we potentially already have somebody hired to do them. Did a great job on the test post that I gave him. So we're going to see if that goes forward long term. Um, regardless, we will have timestamps in the description. If not, the day it goes live very soon after. And as we go forward, we'll be implementing a process yes. to get things recorded sooner, to have everything prepped. It's all a process. But yeah, we're, yep. we're moving towards being better prepped all the time. That would be lovely. That would be lovely indeed. All right. I think that about does it for this episode. So guys, thank you so much for watching slash listening. And uh, as always, we will see you in next week's episode. Stay cute. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon.